Hello, and welcome to um, our conversation with Representative Tana Sanchez. Um, my name is Jordan James Harville, and I am the new program, a national program director here at Advanced Native Political Leadership. Um, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation and a descendant of the Choctaw Nation residing here in Remitish Ohlone lands in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I want to start really quick by framing the conversation before we introduce our wonderful guest. Um, and it's important because October leads us into Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and as we set the stage for 2022, um, um, the midterm season, we're looking back actually to 2020 and all of the wonderful successes um, that our community had in the victories. Um, and we want to also look forward to 2022 midterms and say, what else can we do and how can we build on those successes um, in the future? Advance um, ourselves is focused, laser focused this year on uh, recruiting, training, and supporting Native candidates for running for office in 2022. And we're actually launching our first cohort um, in December. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and I ex I'm excited to hear um, more about it. So um, I want to get started by welcoming uh, Representative Tana Sanchez um, and saying, giving a little brief intro. Um, so Representative um, Sanchez is a dedicated advocate and proven progressive who spent her life um, helping strengthen the community around her. Tana's Shoshone Bannock, um, you and Carrizo, and grew up in Portland. Uh, she has received a Bachelor of Arts um, from Merrill Hurst University and Master's in Social Work from Portland State. From early on in her life, Tana was active in the fight for indigenous and women's rights. She protested um, coal and uranium on native reservations and was a leader in international organizations such as the Indigenous Women's Network and the International Indian Treaty Council. Um, Tana has always stood up um, for social justice on the side of the oppressed, and that is the approach she brings to the Oregon State Legislature. So I want to welcome Representative Sanchez. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. So um, to get this conversation started, um, I wanted to ground us in our histories. Um, so when you think about who brought you here, um, who do you think of as the ancestors who inspired your journey to leadership? Oh my goodness, so many because of course I was a I was a child of the the amazing political times of the 70s, right? Where um I got to meet people like um Bill Wapapa and uh you know Thomas Banyakia and, and Floyd Westerman, Bill Means, uh, Russell Means, all of those folks like were a part of my growing up, Dennis Banks, different people who were a part of like really strong sort of the beginnings of the American Indian movement. And as we're moving forward in that and re regaining ceremony and doing things like the longest walk, like that was my foundation of growing up. So you can't, you can't, I don't, from in Indian country anyway, get much more political than that, right? Absolutely. Um, well, we'd love to kind of open that up and, and talk a little bit more about your personal story, um, if you'd like to share it. What in your own life, what experiences were foundational to kind of where you are now um, in leadership? Wow. Okay. Foundational. Well, yeah. let me just say, when I was a um, very young person, I don't know, probably 12, 13, maybe, um, I was back home on the reservation in Utah, Fort Duchesne, mm -hmm. and we used to have a, a really amazing like resort hotel there, right? That's how the tribe made money. And there was this, there's a man-made lake there called Bottle Hollow. Interesting name, but oh well. And of course, you know, we're, you know, ready little res kids out there at the lake, right? You know, throwing rocks in the water. We didn't get in and swim really, but, you know, we were just throwing rocks around and stuff. And there was a couple of um, non-native girls sitting over there in bikinis and whatnot. And we were, as we're throwing rocks, of course, we're splashing water and they're getting wet and they're getting all cranky about it. And they said, why don't you Indians go back to where you came from? Go back to Wounded Knee. <laughs> that was a pivotal moment in my mind. It really truly was because they had no idea where they were. They had no idea, you know, whose land, whose language, you know, what we, who we were at all. They had no clue. And they were telling us on the Uena Honore Reservation of Fort Duchesne to go back to Wounded Knee, you know. So must've been 73, I was 12. Yeah. Set the stage for native folks um, nationally, right? Where we stood. Exactly, exactly. And it, it exactly told me and my, you know, relatives there, my brothers and sisters, cousins or whatever that were there that, you know, here was a population of people who had no clue as to who we were and assumed we didn't belong, which is really amazing. 
it's it's insane to think about moments like that and to see kind of the battles that we're still facing today and and maybe that are coming to the forefront around critical race theory and, and things like that. Um, it's it's kind of full circle in that sense, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I want to kind of pivot off that because um, as we're getting closer to November, you know, every year there's an election, even though it doesn't necessarily feel like it to everybody. Um, there is an election and, you know, before you were an elected official, you're likely a registered voter. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the first time you voted and what your first election was and maybe what inspired you to vote? Wow, I don't even remember that far back. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have to say, I, well, I sort of, I do remember registering to vote as a Democrat. And I just remember it was a part of a longer conversation with, you know, amongst other Native people, kind of about, you know, we need to be in this, we can't pretend like this doesn't affect us, right? And so I was probably maybe 19, 20 or something like that, like relatively young, probably could have, you know, had gotten on the on it earlier, but yeah, somewhere around there. But it was that very much a political conversation about the fact that we needed to engage, right? We needed to have our voices heard and that they weren't being heard and that people assumed, uh, you know, that we were insignificant population and that it didn't matter. And yet, you know, it really, really does. I think I think we made an impact. I think I think if we didn't make an impact in terms of actual votes necessarily, we made an impact in amongst our own people to say that it does matter that your voice is heard. Absolutely. They say, you know, so much of our our um, our ideology around politics and how we come into it is based in our family. Was was your family particularly political? You know, not at first. Not at first. Then I think I think it was actually me and my brothers and sisters that got us to that point of really uh, recognizing those things. Because as I said, we were sort of, you know, that mid seventies kind of uh, young people and recognizing that so many things were going on around us that were very very different. My cousins were at Alcatraz, you know, in in the late sixties, early seventies, right? Like we we grew up in that moment in time that was so volatile, you know kind of a little bit post civil, um, you know, um, civil rights era, but really still rolling in it and still really Vietnam, all of that kind of thing was just very, very prominent in people's minds. And just recognizing those continual inequities in life. And how do we make that different? How do we shift that? And then literally, um, uh, the, uh, what is it, jumping bull uh, situation you know, that camp there, that happened, like all of that stuff, really recognizing that people we knew, actually, were involved in this, in all of these political things. And I was a young person when, um, when Leonard Peltier uh, and uh, Dennis Banks and Kamuk Banks uh, were coming through Ontario, Oregon, and they were pulled over and, uh, you know, searched and everything, and Leonard Peltier escaped to Canada. Mm -hmm. After all of that, right, and then the rest of them were brought to to Portland for trial, and we were there. Like we were there, we literally are waving at them down the street, you know, like little Indian kids. You know, it was really amazing, an amazing moment in time. So you can't really, you know, I, I think about that and think about how young people today are have that sort of moment of I was at Standing Rock, you know, it's it's almost the same. It's like the same type of thing, you know. You have that political moment where it shifts your mind and your and your thought about how you how you live in the world. I went to San Francisco State and came to political consciousness kind of here in San Francisco um, growing up, and we had the Richard Oaks Center um, and and kind of the the legacy of Alcatraz was something that kind of rippled and inspired a lot of the Native students who who went there, which is one of the largest populations. And I think about moments like Standing Rock when I think of how those very important moments can ripple throughout time and, and inspire the next generation. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's amazing. So saying that, um, you know, Native American voting rights have been under attack nationally for, I mean, a long time, obviously, since the beginning of the Republic, essentially. Um, and Advance wants to keep our community kind of aware of these issues and engaged in their states and locally to ensure that the Native vote is kind of protected in the long term. Do you have any experience with overcoming barriers to voting and um, maybe working through your office to, to address some of those barriers? Well, 
I have to say here in Oregon, at least, you know, I feel like we have, you know, I mean, Oregon was one of the, it was, I think, the first state to have mail-in ballots, right? Like we have been doing this for a very, very long time when we've made it relatively easy for folks. Um, and of course, now, sadly, the, um, uh, what's his name, DeJoy out of the Postal Service is trying to slow that all down for us. Right, like that's a whole nother interesting effort. And I think about it as it, that's not just our rights as Native people, but it's 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 the rights of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Because Oregon's such a uh, such a blue state. And we want to admit when we want to say it's purple, but it's really it's pretty blue, purple blue, maybe. But you know, we've been of course advocating for other folks, you know, who like for instance um, in North Dakota and Montana, who. Uh, who were basically there, they wanted to make it so that you had to actually have a street address. Well, who has a street address on the res, right? You know, and we, we don't have street addresses on most of our reses here either. And no one would even consider doing something like that. Um, again, mailing ballots, right? We have, we have that advantage. So it's, so it's a little different for us maybe, but we can see it certainly uh, for other native folks in different parts of the country that are, that are struggling with that. Um, we've been somewhat privileged by mail-in ballots for a long time. It's really great because or Oregon's really the model in that. It's what we all use to kind of hopefully roll that out nationally. Um, this last year in 2020, when um, when we were in Arizona, the um, Navajo Nation was facing a similar problem, right? And, and it's like these communities in Montana and South Dakota and Arizona are really our frontline communities when it comes to kind of protecting the native vote, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so have you seen um, our native community work to reduce barriers to voting in a broader level? Can you talk a little bit about that? You mentioned North Dakota. Well, um, so yeah, so those pieces, just about the whole address thing. I think what I really see amongst uh, native people is some of the barriers are, I mean, you kind of go back and forth on it. People collecting, being able to at one point collect ballots. You can't kind of do that now because it's, it, you know, it's considered maybe one way or the other. Um, could go either way, I guess that was the thing. And we have had, you know, sadly, uh, this last year or two years ago, I think, an incident in Oregon where a, a number of ballots didn't get deposited at all. And they were found like months later. Like, and that was a very small uh, number, small, small example, but their votes still mattered, right? Mm -hmm. I think what's happening for, for us here, though, in, in, uh, in the Indian country of Oregon it really is just the the getting that word out that there's a huge difference between our tribal um, you know voting for tribal stuff and the national vote and or the or making it more important I guess for folks to rec recognizing that you know that state representative that represents your district should still matter as well right and how do we how do we get that to be a little bit different i you know myself i'm only the second native american to ever serve in oregon's legislature and i am not an oregon tribal member right most of oregon's tribes are in more rural areas they're often very republican areas and they're not you know necessarily serving our tribal populations at all and so that 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 getting out that vote is a lot harder because most of our tribal populations are like really more concerned about the congressional, you know, votes versus, or their tribal council votes versus actually doing more, much more of a statewide thing. But that does actually matter. It matters who represents you. And it's sometimes so, so that the, it's access to voting and access to that information about what matters in, in terms of voting for uh, people who are going to represent you in your state. You mentioned a little bit about how, um, you know, folks maybe engage in tribal elections over, over you know, federal or state elections. You know, we've noticed that too, when we look at the, the research, right, folks actually participate in pretty high levels in tribal elections. It's not like Native folks are not civically engaged. They very much are. They're choosing in many, in some instances and, and restricted in others um, to not engage, right? What do you think, how do you think that we communicate the importance or, or draw the line between what happens um, on tribal reses or, or even in, in, you know, urban environments and what's happening um, in maybe Congress or in Oregon state legislature even? I think that has a lot to do with people just recognizing what that actually means, right? Um, one of the things that we've tried to do here in Oregon, of course, is to really get much more civics education in our mm -hmm. schools, 
right? And and having people have a greater understanding of what that looks like. Um, I think, you know, you're right about, you know, our, our tribal populations wanting to really focus on their own, you know, tribal elections. That makes much more sense because you know those people, you know who they are. So what's important then maybe is that state representatives or people who are running for those offices are able to get there and, you know, recognize the tribes as important, uh, you know, folks in in that in the process, right? Um, we had uh, uh, Karina Miller ran for the Senate uh, last year in, was it last year? Year poor, in, uh, uh, out of Warm Springs or that area right there. And, you know, it was, it was going to be a hard run no matter what, because she's a Democrat running in a, in a primarily Republican area. Um, but it, what mattered is that people knew who she was. Because she had a fairly decent showing. But the question is, you know, from the other end of it, do people even know who that current representative or senator is in that district? And very likely they don't because they don't see that person as representing them. And they don't see that as a, as a, as a, a vote worth, you know, taking really, because it, it doesn't impact them necessarily, or at least they don't think it does, right? The tribal, you know, the tribal uh, chairperson or people on council is what impacts them. What do you, um, I guess, as we start to kind of think about that, it, it was a wonder to kind of see um, in the 2020 election, the first time the president, the presidential candidates did a little bit of a tour around Indian country, not to every tribe or anything like that, maybe to the major ones to get their, their street cred up or something, I don't know. Um, but it was kind of a wonder to, to kind of see them engaging with the tribes a little bit and appointing the first, um, you know, uh, native coordinators and things like that and working to kind of organize the native community. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Do you you think that if maybe politicians had a little bit more presence and understanding what was actually happening on the ground on not only on our tribal lands but maybe in the middle of Portland, do you think that folks would engage a little bit more? Uh, sometimes that does work. You know, certainly getting a native person who uh, who knows the area, who knows the tribes, who knows you know a lot about the politics internally, um, that is helpful. You know, mm -hmm. but here's the thing is. Sometimes they have to just have a little more clarity about what the history of, you know, our situation is. Your average human being, and of these political folks are just average human beings on some levels, don't really have a clue what the word sovereignty actually means in tribal politics. They don't have a clue about what blood quantum is, or, you know, enrollment is, like those key words that we all know what that means, right? They don't have a clue. They're completely out of context for them. And until they have somewhat of an understanding about that, it makes it harder to have the conversation, right? So people, it's, I think it really is important, obviously, to have somebody, you know, who's doing your political work on the ground and getting you into the right spots to meet people and whatnot. That's always really, really important. But having a deeper understanding of, of how things are different for native populations is, is really key in my opinion. Certainly helps if your representative is native themselves, right? It does indeed. <laughs> um, saying that, we're, we've kind of been talking a little bit about the importance of voting, but there is an election coming up this November. Um, and, you know, it's not nearly getting the attention that the midterms and the presidential election is and never does after a presidential year, right? Because everyone's tired understandably. Um, what would you say to the members of our community about the importance of voting, um, even in elections that might not be so high profile? Well, just reminding people again that your, your vote does count. Um, I, uh, I won my first election by 168 votes. And our current mayor, or sorry, our current governor here in Oregon run, won her very first election by seven. That's the governor of the state of Oregon. Her very first election was, uh, I believe, to the House. She won it by seven votes. So if you think your vote doesn't mean anything, tell the governor that, right? And, and again, myself, 168 votes. If 168, nine people decided not to do anything that day, I wouldn't be here, right? And we would not have been able to move so much amazing legislation. And the voice of Native people there in the Oregon legislature wouldn't be there if 169 people had stayed home and just not bothered, 
left that ballot sitting there on the kitchen table or in the recycling bin. All of a sudden, that two to three percent of the population starts looking a lot bigger, right? <laughs> exactly. And we are 3.7 percent of the population in my district. Native people are 3.7 percent of the population in my district, you know, which is relatively small if you think about it. But that's about average for Native populations all over, right? Right. Well, I mean, one thing, you know, as, as we're seeing kind of the trends nationally, more and more districts are actually heading into more competitive territory, right? And so more and more elections are being decided by 50 votes, 100 votes, 200 votes. 3.7% is a lot. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a, it's a lot. And I think, I think people need to recognize that, that your one vote does in fact count. It makes so much more difference. And, you know, and sometimes I will tell you other things that really bother me that sometimes these smaller elections stuff slides by you that you're not paying attention to. And then you wonder like, what the hell happened there? <laughs> <More strategic. laughs> it is, it can be done like that. And you want people to pay attention to that kind of thing because the fact that we'll wonder about it later and then be you know, frustrated by it is, is and I have to say there, I have, I have done that. I have not paid attention to certain things in particular times and then wondered what the hell happened there you know, and have to own that, right? You have to own it that you didn't, that you didn't participate at one point in time. And now, of course, I, I vote every single time because it's absolutely necessary that we're paying attention. Absolutely. Even in the 2021 election, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to switch topics a little bit to talk a little bit more about you. And you kind of opened up that conversation. Um, when you were running for office, what gave you the most strength and support and kind of what helped you keep going when, when the going got hard? Well, um, I have to say that, um, you know, the decision to run in the first place was kind of that moment in time where you just went, okay, I guess, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know, I tell you about that a little bit. Um, the, the senator who was in office at that point decided to retire and the representative at that point decided to jump for that Senate seat, which left that representative seat open. And I got a text message from a friend that said, this has happened. You should, you should run for this seat. And my literal response back in text message was, ha, 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 right? And I thought, you know, and he, he said, texts back, he says, no, I'm not kidding. Seriously, you should, we don't have any representation. And that was what sort of hit me right there was like, there's, you know, at that point, we didn't know that Jackie Taylor had, uh, she was citizen Potawatomi, had been in the Oregon legislature in the mid 90s. But, it, and she was the only one, mm -hmm. right? And recognizing that as Native communities did not have the representation in the Oregon State House ever in the, you know, 160 years, 50 something years at that point, um, that this had been a state no Native people had ever served in that legislature. That was amazing and really, really stunning. And so for me, it was really about our community needs to be heard and seen. And what kept me going in that is that uh, so many times Native people would come up to me and shake my hand and have money in it, you know, just like you do from that old perspective, you know, like you you know, you do it a giveaway or something like that. And I'm like, okay, we can't do this. We have to write it down. We have to do all of these things, right? Um, I had friends who, um, who, did, who had fry bread stands, right? They had them all the time at every different powwow and whatnot. Um, they would give me their tip jar. Wow. And, you know, like, so for me, and knowing that some families, some individuals would give me like $2, you know? I was like, oh man, you know? that my community is giving whatever they have for me to, to run this campaign, to be able to do this. You know, I've never been able to give up on my community ever. And so, you know, it was a determination at that point that I had to do it because my community is depending on me to do it. So that's really what, you know, kept me going most of the time is not about, you know, and I hated asking people for money. I hated asking people because that's so not my culture, right? So we don't ask people for stuff. But the fact that my own community is just literally handing me money. That's what kept me moving in this process and just saying, okay, I got to do this. 
I got to do it for my community. We should also place a stake in the ground and say that Native people were the first to do grassroots fundraising before it was cool. Um, Absolutely. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They do it so well, right? And everything we do, we have food at, right? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I've never given to a candidate and got fry bread. So that's, that's not fair, but you know, <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to call out something that you, you said, because it's something that we hear a lot here at Advance actually is um, that someone called on you to, to run. And what we hear from folks time and time again, it's that someone asked them to run. It's not that they chose to run themselves. Do you think that you would have ran ever if someone wanted to have kind of reached out and said, this is the time, please do it? Not likely. Sadly, it's not likely because again, not our culture to be go pick me, pick me. You know, I can lead the people, right? Usually when somebody's doing that, you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you make that face and you kind of go, oh God, man, I don't know about that guy, you know, whatever. Like it's, that's not who we are, you know, from a cultural perspective, we're, we're pushing people forward because because they're the people that we want to lead us. You know, I'm pushing people forward too, you know? Um, but the fact that, that I, was, I was asked by, you know, a native person in my community to do this. And let me just say, when we first started doing it, like we literally were behind, you know, we're all showing up at somebody's house and around their kitchen table and trying to get it figured out, literally kitchen table cabinet, right? literally and and you know we of course recognized almost immediately that we had to get you know we had to get a political consultant because it's not easy running for office is so not easy um there are so many details to it there are so many rules and laws that you have to follow now and that's important too but um you know recognizing that it's a process and it sadly takes a lot of money to do it um, and depending on your jurisdiction or your area, you know, there's different rules that you have to follow. But I think I think jumping into it, it was it was it was harder than I thought it was going to be. And there were many times when I was very stressed out and pissed off. <laughs> and I will be I have to say my um, my uh, primary uh, opponent was uh, also a woman of color. And hearing somebody uh, in a, a PAC group say something like, well, you're both women of color and you, you answered this questions very similarly, how are we supposed to choose? And I'm like, you choose the exact same way you do between two white guys. Like, that's how you do it. It's never you know? been a problem before. <laughs> no, it's never been a problem before. What difference does it make now that two women of color are running for the same office? It shouldn't make, that should make you happy, really that women of color are running for, you know, for a particular political office, white guys do it all the time and you don't even flinch. So here we go, people, you know? I love that. Um, what have you been able to accomplish in office and maybe what are you most proud of in your time as a representative? This is a little bit of bragging rights. <laughs> well, let's see. I will say, first of all, that, um, I got to carry a bill. Now I didn't do all the work on the bill, but I got to carry it. I got to carry Senate Bill 13, which was the bill that would put in native education in Oregon schools and actually fund the tribes to help develop that so that they could actually put their story, their story of Oregon history into education. And the whole point for me behind that was normally people don't get education about tribal populations significantly, except for what's old stuff that's written in books um, until they're in college, right? They don't understand a lot of that, you know, that political, they don't have any kind of political analysis until they're in college. This is an opportunity for, uh, for folks to have some information younger and have more of, a, of an idea of a, like how this thing really worked that's not written from that, that, that standpoint of the colonizer, but it's written by native people, right? Uh, most recently, let's just say, I was able to um, incorporate or basically help push in the Indian Child Welfare Act into the state of Oregon statutes, right? So we have the Oregon Indian Child Welfare Act so that even, even if something ever happens to the federal act, it is embedded in Oregon statutes. 
that was amazing. And of course, the tribes did most of that work, right? I'm just the coordinator in the carrier. And that's all I have to say is it might be bragging rights, but I, you know, I'm doing the work. I'm calling the, I'm calling people together to help do this work, but it really is their work, right? It's the work of the people who wanted Indigenous Peoples Day to be a state, state recognized. So Indigenous Peoples Day is recognized here in the state of Oregon. So on October 11th, at least my office is that are is closed on that day. <laughs> and there might be other native offices and might be other offices all over who knows how many people will recognize that. But the fact that Indigenous Pe Peoples Day is now recognized in the state of Oregon is really important. And I will tell you that I, there's a lot of things that I get excited about in terms of the work that I do. Um, but some of those types of things really being able to um, push the Oregon State Police to actually do um, some work on missing and murdered Indigenous people, you know, and, and actually ask the tribes the question, what's happening, what's going on, what's the problem, what do we need to do better, what do we need to do differently, and, and my hope, uh, we actually are moving a bill in the short session, the coming short session, to actually follow up on their final report. So, it's, it's awesome. That is phenomenal. When um, we talk a little bit about what it means to run for office here at Advance, one of the things we've been talking about is how it's a continuation of activism, right? That maybe you can choose to stand on the front lines of line three. You can, you know, you can choose to go out and organize your community. You can also choose to run for office and to, to give a voice to, to the community that's already working on the issues important to us, right? Do yeah. you think, um, do you see yourself as an activist in the role that you currently hold? Uh, uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> I have been an activist since I was a teenager, right? Since that first moment, you know, at, at Bottle Hollow. Mm -hmm. I recognized that, you know, this isn't right, you know, and, and I have to say that um, even though my dad, my dad was very, you know, understood a lot of politics, uh, but he wasn't like, he wasn't necessarily pushing himself out there to do that, but he was okay with us and was very excited about what we did and pushed us forward to do the political activism that we did, right? So it, that was, that's an amazing opportunity right there. You may, I mean, I did stuff for years, right? Uh, in, the, in the movement to, to just advance who we were and to make people hear us, right? And then of course I went into social work because what I recognized also is that um, we can do all the political activism we want but if our people are still struggling, they're not going to be solid enough to get that work done and to help themselves move forward. And so I went and got that master's degree in social work and decided to work on in domestic violence, foster care, aging and disability and veteran services and early childhood programs, because I want our community to be strong. And then in my analysis of, you know, that question about should you run for office? Well, I recognize what the laws in the state of Oregon do to the people on the ground and what resources that we pass through to the to uh, community based organizations and social service organizations, what that what that impact is. I know what that is, and I know it from right there where we're literally helping to pay somebody's rent because they lost their job or whatever something happened or literally trying to build child care centers so that people can have their kids in safe care while they go to work or while they go to school. Like those things are amazingly important. And how that happens, that, that's, it's all this massive trickle down of, of, of resources and information and whatnot. But if our voice isn't heard from the ground, then maybe it doesn't happen, right? We talked a, a little bit earlier about Kind of the differences between maybe a politician who is, is non-native and learning about the native community and a native politician themselves um, i think folks maybe don't realize the extent to which legislators both have a hard touch right where they can introduce bills but they also have soft touches to to educate their colleagues and to introduce new ideas to the space can you talk a little bit about that oh yeah oh yeah that that's actually very fun it's mm -hmm. very fun to do um i actually had um a moment in time on literally on the house floor where somebody was some other on the other side was talking about how they didn't want to let go of all of their all of this history and all of this you know our forefathers did blah 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 blah, blah. 
And there's a point at the end of every session. And so I couldn't speak to it, of course, because it, it was irrelevant to that, to a degree. But there's a point at, at, the, at the end of every session where you have an opportunity to do what's called a remonstrance. So you have three minutes to mm -hmm. remonstrate on whatever you, you know, was going on that day. And mm -hmm. so I did a remonstrance on the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy Great Law of Peace and really explained like what that is and how that is the foundation of the very chamber that we sit in. So let's talk about forefathers. And it was very quiet. <laughs> and you know, so it's such an amazing opportunity, right? You get those opportunities now and then. And I've had many opportunities to explain what implicit bias is mm -hmm. on that house floor. So whether they like it or not, they have to hear sometimes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Well, we're coming a little bit to the end of our session, but I wanted to close by asking you one last question, which is um, what would you like to accomplish if we saw more Native folks in office, whether that's in the Oregon State Legislature or I don't know, in the White House? Well, um, let me just say, there was a, there's a young man in my community who, who said um, that that's what he wants to do. He wants to be the first Native American president, right? And, you know, we're, 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 we're moving him in that direction. But what we could do actually is, or what I'm hoping to do, I'm really hoping to shift some of the things that have been our legacy, right? And that have been the embedded trauma that we all have as indigenous people. Because even though we may not have experienced boarding schools, we live with the generational trauma of it. Even though we may not have experienced those exclusionary laws for native people in different communities, we live with the legacy of that. We, we, we live with the whole, uh, just the trauma and things that we're, I mean, we will all right now live in the trauma of missing and murdered indigenous women. How will we heal that? The only way we're going to heal that is, is helping people understand that difference that understanding, that embedded trauma and grief and, and how we've expressed it and figuring out how do we do that differently in the future so that in, you know, in generations to come, our people don't have to struggle with some of those things. That's what I wanna build. That's what I wanna change and shift. So that's about education over and over and over and over again so that we can change the mindset for people so that implicit bias is implicit that you understand something rather than damage it. It's so important. It's foundational, right? The education that we provide. Um, thank you so much, Representative Sanchez, for taking the time to come in and speak to us about this. Um, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and I wanna thank the, the kind of audience in the community that maybe joined us as well and might be thinking about either running for office themselves or nominating someone to run for office. We heard from Representative Sanchez herself that um, that was key to her journey, right? And it might be key to the next native legislator that we put in the Oregon State House. So I'm really excited for that. I wanna close um, a little bit by um, kind of directing to the resources and what we're doing here at Advance. Um, you know, leaders uh, kind of like Representative Sanchez um, are powerful examples of why we must remain engaged, um, use our native vote, um, and why our, we need to encourage our community to take steps into leadership themselves. Um, so if folks listening, if you or someone that you know um, is a native person considering to take those steps, we'd love to talk to you. Um, and you can check out our website at advancednativepl.org um, for more information and to learn how to support the next generation of Native leaders for office. Um, there's 519,000 legislators and elected officials in the United States um, and only 112 Native elected officials. We need 16,000 to reach parity. So we have a journey to go, but I'm super confident um, that with folks like you, Representative Sanchez, that we're gonna get there. So thank you so much for joining us today. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Thanks.